Steve Conrad, welcome to Tech Talk with Daniel. Thank you. Glad to be here. I've been really looking forward to this conversation as you are the first Sierra developer I get to interview. I usually interview LucasArts people. All of the Sierra guys ghost me for some reason. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know why. I don't, that, there's, no, uh, there's no NDA that I know of that all these years later. It's been a long time. I, I thought it was company policy. <laughs> like, like, I, like we talked about earlier, um, not, not that I know. <laughs> anyway, let's start at the beginning. How did you get into programming? Programming, um, yeah. We, we, well, I love games. I was always a gamer. My dad brought home Pong way back in the seventies, I think it was. And then uh, he used to—he was a band teacher, and and so he would bring home old computers. It was like a pet pet, I think it was called, uh, with different games on it. And um, and then he bought an Apple Two E pretty early on in the early eighties. And I remember loving Wizardry. That was one of the big games. Uh, that I liked a lot on the Apple IIe. And so, yeah, I was, I was a gamer from the beginning of, beginning of the games. Um, and so I tried, I tried to learn a little bit of programming on my own back in the day. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and also I remember having some art stuff. I was, there was a basketball game. I, I was always a basketball fan, and there was a basketball game. Um, Larry Bird versus Max Johnson one-on-one, I think it was. Um, and I was trying to do some art. Um, I think it was just, uh, I can't remember the details, but I think it was just frame by frame uh, artwork. But I also, yeah, there's definitely some pro- basic programming back then. And uh, yeah, I just, I was always interested in programming. Um, and then when I went to college, well, well, first of all, let me, I'll tell you, my, my parents were professional musicians, uh, classical musicians. So I grew up in a musical family. Um, and I, I played, they put, they made me play the violin for many years. I got pretty good at it, at it certainly from five years old. Um, but I was never a big fan of it. Um, I mean, I mean, I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing, playing, but that wasn't my choice. Um, and I had to practice and take lessons. Um, uh, but anyways, that's in seventh grade, I, I chose the trombone, which I still play today. Um, and, uh, so, and, all right, so I got off track here. So anyways, um, I, oh yeah. So the, the reason I was bringing that up is because I wanted to go into music and I, I got into jazz and, and of course my parents knowing that it's hard to make any money in music, they, um, discouraged me and, and basically said they wouldn't support me in college if I, if I went into music. They wanted me to have, to make a living, uh, make some good money and not struggle. Um, so I was, I was always good at math. Um, and, well, until I had calculus, but that's another story. But, uh, um, anyways, I was good at math. So I, I went into engineering and I didn't know what kind of engineering I wanted to do at first. And so I was in general engineering, um, started at ASU in Arizona, Arizona state university. And, um, and then I had to pick a major. I, I started, I went to electrical engineering, just, I think, no, I think I had mechanical engineering and then electrical engineering and I, and it wasn't, wasn't grabbing me. And then, so finally I switched to uh, computer programming and engineering. Um, and I ended up changing schools to NAU, which is Northern Arizona university up in Flagstaff. Um, and that was a great experience. And I, and I had a jazz scholarship on trombone, um, while I was doing my engineering major. Um, so it was great times, got to play in the jazz band every day and um, with the you know, wind, wind symphony. Um, but also I was studying and I really, I really um, applied myself a lot more when, once I switched schools. Um, because the first time I took calculus, I, I fail, failed. I, I, I had a little bit in high school, so I said, ah, you had a choice between two semesters or three semesters. And I said, ah, I, I had some high school, I did a two semester path. But I failed both of them back to back. And then I had to take them both again, um, at NAU, I believe it was, um, anyways, I really buckled down and I got great grades at NAU. Um, in high school, it was just easy, but college was a different story. Um, so I wasn't prepared, but I buckled down, got great A's, got into honor society. Um, and, uh, and started my programming journey. I had some great programming instructors uh, at NAU. Uh, Steve Wampler just came to mind <laughs> as I'm talking about it. Um, 
but uh, yeah, started off. Well, I actually started off with the Fort, Fortran at ASU, and then uh, Pascal was the learning language in uh, at NAU, and then eventually learned some C, but uh, it wasn't. And then so, anyways, yeah. So I, I really lo- lo- loved programming and. Just the, it's basically just problem solving, constant problem solving. I was also uh, puzzle solving. I was also, I always love love puzzles. I still do puzzles to this day. Not not jigsaw puzzles, but like word puzzles, like Wordle, daily Wordle, um, and a jumble and uh, New York Times. Uh, I just do the, the <laughs> mini crossword. Anyways, I, I I enjoy solving problems, and that's basically what my job has been for the last thirty three years of um, game programming. Um, and which I just retired from, by the way, in April of this year. Um, uh, yeah, so I love programming and, and puzzle solving. And, and then late, later on, so actually, so Sierra Online, I don't know if you know, probably do know, is they had their own programming language called SCI. It was a Sierra um, mm-hmm. creative interpreter. Um, it was Lisp-like yeah. in, in form. Um, and so that's what I, I got really good at. Well, first of all, first of all, before the Sierra online, let me just tell you out of college. Yeah. I, before, before we get the Sierra, I wanted to know, yeah. you mentioned that you were a gamer. Oh yeah. Since you were young, were you already a fan of Sierra games by that time when oh, you were yeah. in college? Oh yeah. I, I played, um, I think before college, um, I, I was, I was a big fan of the space quest series two guys from Andromeda in uh, those games. Um, but I had played King's Quest and, oh, and Lisa, Lisa Sue Larry, as all kid, young boys <laughs> probably played and had to get past that, the security questions. <laughs> that was, wasn't too tough. Um, but yeah, no, I was yeah, a big It's funny because played. the security questions back then, the security questions back then were difficult for uh, kids. Well, adults were able to answer all of them because they were more um, more in tune with uh, with the subjects that were covered in those questions. But well, nowadays, if you try to answer the same questions, no one knows the answers. <laughs> yeah, I don't even remember what the questions were. Um, but yeah, probably. And well, except for now, you can you can Google it and you get the answer. <laughs> mm-hmm. But anyways, yeah. So I was a big Sierra fan um, before. Um, well, I was in, well, b- before college and in college. Um, but I, yeah, I liked Epic Games too, but, but adventure games were my, my favorite. I mean, that was always my favorite type of game. So, and so um, since you were a fan of adventure games, did you decide to go to work at Sierra or did you try a different path after you uh, graduated? I, I didn't even think about going into games um, at the time when I was in college because that was like, like a dream. I mean, I didn't, I mean, think to dream that at the time. Um, and so I got a regular engineering job, um, in, in Arizona at Honeywell Bowl doing mainframe, um, software, um, for, a um, it was emulator software to emulate this new hardware that they had. And, and I hated it. It was horrible. Um, I didn't enjoy it at all. And I, I really never got into it. Um, and uh, so anyways, the company, they were having layoffs. Basically, I actually, I, I got the job offer while I was in college and then they rescinded it. But then, uh, and, and so I had no job after, out of college. And then a few weeks later, though, they, they, they re um, gave me the job. And so that's why I did that for two years. But they were having layoffs every six months at this company. And I lasted two years and yeah, I, like I said, I never really got into it or really knew what I was doing. Um, and, uh, and I got laid off and, and then, so then the story is, um, I went to a job fair and at this job fair, it was all engineering companies like Boeing and Intel. And I can't remember what else, but Sierra online was at the company. I was at, the, I mean, it was at the uh, job fair. And, and that was a dream. That was a dream to work at Sierra. So I remember I, I modified my, um, my resume. I made a special resume just for the Sierra online um, job. And that was my dream. I, that's what I really wanted. And so, yeah, I applied, gave my, re- my resume, and, uh, and I got a job offer to, to move to Oakhurst, California, 
and um, and program at uh, Sierra Online, which was which I what was, was great. so special about that resume. What did you write there that you didn't write in uh, resumes you gave uh, to other companies? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm trying to remember. I, I think I just made it more games focused, um, and and maybe talked about the my music background more, just uh, like the creative aspect. I, I think I think I emphasize the creative aspect of my background, and uh, and the and the games that I maybe mentioned games that I had played and how and how I love Sierra games. Um, I yeah, I can't remember exactly, but hey, that's a good question. Hobbies: King's Quest, Police Quest, Space Quest. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't a police quest guy, but yeah, Space Quest was a big one for me. And I had, did play the King's Quest. I think I played the original. Um, and yeah, so anyways, I got I got the job. And I remember I did a little bit of salary negotiation because I was, I think I was making 30000 at the time, uh, my entry-level job at Honeywell Bowl. And, and I think Sierra offered me $26,000, if I remember right. And I was able to... to do a new build negotiation got up to, I think 28, I think I started, started selling uh, 28,000 back, back in 1991. Um, I remember I started on tax day, April 15th, 1991, um, at the Oakhurst offices. And that was a big change for me. I'd never been out of Arizona, um, and uh, moving out away from family and out on my own in an apartment, um, in Oakhurst. And, but that was the start of a beautiful experience. Uh, worked with great, great people that that uh, I love to this day, and, and in fact, I keep threatening, and and I'm I was just thinking about it recently. I, I want to have a, I want to I want to organize a reunion in Oakhurst. Um, I'm I'm thinking I'm really going to work for for next summer now that I have time now that I'm retired. Um, but I love to see all the the old group and see how many we can get to go back to Oakhurst. And there's a few that are that never left. We should get the entire crew of Phantasmagoria too. We just interviewed <laughs> them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every every anybody from Sierra um, is welcome. <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna I'll look into that. But uh, but yeah, it was, it was yeah. I met yeah, those wonderful people, and I just had the time of my life, and that was a great period of uh, in my life um, for sure. And I, I mean, I ended up getting married and and have my kids during my Sierra online days. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot happened during those, it was nine, nine years, 1991 to, uh, 96, you know, cursed. And then I moved up to the, the new Bellevue headquarters in 96 and worked till the end of 1999. Um, could you share what your experience was like on the first day at Sierra? First day. I, I, <laughs> I just remember being in, um, in an office, the Sierra Online always had offices with multiple people, um, like maybe eight to ten people in a in a room. And and now that I think about it, they had they had daily tours, and so we had glass windows, and people would come by, they're looking in. And I remember we put funny signs out there like "Don't feed the programmers" and things like that. But they they would come through. Um, but anyways, that, that wasn't the first day. First day, I I remember we're meeting Warren. Sh- Schwader, I think I think that was his name, who was like from the old days of Sierra Online. And I believe I had read the, the Hacker's book, which is, I believe, a third of it's dedicated to the old Sierra Online days. So that was really cool to meet um, to meet him. And he was currently working on, on, on Hoyle, Hoyle games, um, card games, I believe. Um, but uh, so mm-hmm. I met him. I met a bit. I might have even met. Ken Williams and not, not known it because he, he used to be real casual back then with like cutoffs with holes in the knees. And <laughs> I'm pretty, I think I, I might've met him on the first day. I'm not sure, but I met him early on and, and maybe didn't even know who, who he was at the beginning. Um, but, but yeah, I had little interactions with him all through the, through the years and I end, end up actually was one of his proofreaders on his, on his recent book that he, came out with a couple of years ago. Uh, but yeah, it, I was just so happy to be there. And, and like I said, I didn't do too well at my previous job. And this, this one, I was determined to be the, become the best game programmer possible. So I, I remember where I worked my butt off from the beginning. Oh yeah, that's right. There was like a, there was a two, I think it was a six week um, period 
where you had to prove yourself. Um, so there are a bunch of, bunch of young programmers started around that time. And, uh, yeah, there was a six week, six weeks. You had to really prove yourself. So I, I, I dug in hard and I really worked at it and put in extra time and start learning the SCI, the, the programming language. And I feel like I got pretty good at it and le- learning how, how they put adventure games together uh, in the Sierra style. Um, and yeah, so there's all these other young programmers also starting. I, I, I remember one crazy kid, now that we're talking about it, who, who, <laughs> who brought a crossbow to, <laughs> not, I don't know if to work, but he was shooting outside or something and he got in trouble and he got let go. <laughs> But there was, yeah, there was, uh, there was some turnover in that time. I remember, because I remember some people that stayed on. Um, I remember meeting, uh, I don't know if Lorelai Shannon was there right at the beginning, but I remember, remember meeting her early on and, and her husband, and now his name escapes me now, uh, who was a programmer. Um, anyway, so yeah, so yeah, those early days were just exciting and, and new and, I was um, in a new, whole new environment and with creative people, and it was fantastic. Now, you joined Sierra around the same time they started using the SCI engine, the Sierra Creative Interpreter, uh, instead of the classic AGI engine, right. which was the engine they used for those classic games. Were you disappointed that you didn't get to work on AGI, or were you excited about the fact that now you don't have to? type text to perform commands in the game. Right. Um, Yeah. Well, I remember, I think it was actually a crossover where we're still able to, I don't remember exactly, but I thought you could could still have a window for typing in text as well as the the new icon system. Um, At one early on, if I remember right. Um, But then later on, we went to full full icon based. Um, No more typing in. Um, but I, I used to play, I played mystery house back in the day with the original Roberta Williams and, and Ken Williams game. Um, and I played, the, I played those graphics adventures that were just still pictures. Um, what was it? Time, time zone. I think it was like nine on nine discs, uh, five and a half or five and a quarter inch floppies. Um, so I, yeah, I, I played mm-hmm. all those, those types of games where you, you type, yeah, go North, um, pick up the candlestick. Um, do all that. So I, I had played those back in the day. Um, but um, let's see, <laughs> what were we talking about? Um, oh, yeah, I, I really didn't have much knowledge of AGI. I, mean, I think I, I had heard of it, but but no, I, I was glad to be on the latest thing. Um, and it's exciting to be at the beginning of SCI. And speaking of that, that was new to me too. We had a whole, there's a whole room of programmers that were system programmers that just worked on on the operating system. Um, on the game system. And uh, so that was cool. I'm, I remember Larry, Larry Scott was one of the elder statesmen at the time. And uh, there was a whole group, um, maybe six programmers that just worked on this engine to make it and, and make improvements. Um, and they're working on it the whole time, making improvements and taking suggestions from the other programmers that are making the games. And so that was, that was interesting and new, new to me. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I love the language and learning how to, the new syntax, which, which is a lisp like, um, which I studied a little bit in school, but it was totally new. And, but like I said, I really dug in and, and got good at it and, uh, and really took to it. Um, and I feel like I was creating what we called rooms pretty early. Um, you, you would lay down the, the, the areas you could walk through, um, with like, with line drawings, um, and so that would that would be there as you can move move throughout, um, and then you could and then programmers we could actually add our own descriptions of different items, um, and then later on the designers could go back and they might use some of your stuff. I remember doing a lot on Lisa Sularia, a lot of the descriptions and trying trying to do my best to be my my funny self, um, but um, Josh Mandel and um, on on uh, Freddie Fargus. And uh, Al Lowe um, would go through and, and modify them. But so they'd basically be placeholders, but they would use some of your stuff, which was cool. And what was the first project you were involved in during your time at Sierra? I believe the very first game was Leisure Suit Larry 5. And uh, yeah, and uh, I remember my, my, yeah, 
Yeah, that was my first. That was my first project, and I was excited. I, I played Lisa Larry games, and I met Al Lowe, and he's a very affable guy, um, really great guy, and and we bonded over music. He's a jazz saxophone player, and I was playing jazz trombone, so we bonded over that, and uh, yeah, it was a great experience. And, and Brian Hughes was my lead program, my first lead programmer at Sear Online, and he was a great guy, and I learned a lot from him. I remember that. Um, and he, yeah, just learned, learned a lot. Um, took me under his wing and, and Lisa Solari five. Yeah, it was, it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. Oh, and, and that's when I met like a good friend of mine still today who, uh, was a music musician at, uh, Sierra online. His name is Chris Brayman. And, um, and he, and I, I knew of Chris Brayman because he was also a trombone player that, that played, um, with one of the top jazz bands of all time, Maynard Ferguson, back in the eighties. And I had a I had an album that, that Chris played on and and Chris wrote arrangements arrangements for that album and that band. And he had solos on that band. And I remember after a solo um on the on the album, uh Maynard Ferguson yells, Chris Brayman trombone. And uh so I I knew his name from from the from the jazz world. And, and I remember we went out early on in my career at Sierra, there was a softball game out there's a field near, near the, where we worked. And, uh, and Chris Brayman actually came up to me and introduced himself to, to, to me, he said, hi, I'm Chris Brayman. I said, you're not the Chris Brayman from Mayor, Mayor Ferguson, are you? So, so, he, so he had a fanboy and he didn't know it, um, from his music. Um, so he was a great trombone player and great arranger. Um, anyways, he was doing music and he did the lot. I think he did all the music for Lisa to Larry five as well as many other games afterward. And he, he was a really interesting guy because he, he became a programmer later and he was uh, the original lead programmer on the first Phantasmagoria. Um, and so when we worked together on, on that game, and that was, that was in the, our, my later years at Oakers. Now in 1991, your first year at Sierra, um, it was very diverse. You were credited on three family-oriented games, mm. which were Echo Quest, Mixed Up Fairy Tales, and Castle of Dr. Brain, and right. a, a more adult-oriented one with uh, Leisure Suit Larry 5. What a year! <laughs> That's true. I, I, at the time, I didn't think about the disparity in the game, game titles, but I mean, I just did my best on each of them, and yeah, that's, that was something Sierra used to do. They used to move the programmers around a lot wherever needed. Um, so you would go on the end of a game. They're trying to get it out the door. Um, you would move on. I remember doing, yeah, mixed up fairy tales. Um, and that's where I, yeah, I met, um, Corey and Lori. Um, and they were really nice people too. And, uh, yeah. And yeah, that was right. Um, so we, yeah, did all those different games and yeah. Um, Eco quest was really cool. And yeah, it was a good variety of, of game and experience and, and working with different programmers and artists and uh, musicians. Why did they bring extra programmers at the end of the development cycle? Well, they just they needed to get it, get it done. They had some tight deadlines, um, usually around Christmas. Um, and so they put more, <laughs> put more programmers on there to, to get it done. And uh, the way SCI worked, it was easy to integrate new programmers and just give them a room to work on. And, uh, and they would, yeah, and they could do that room. So the more programmers you had, the more rooms they could get done simultaneously. And, uh, that's, that's how we would do it. And that's how we get the games done on time. So, so at that time, programmers were added to a project to add more rooms or to fix bugs or both. Yeah, a little of everything, just just to finish the game. The, the end of the game is always the hardest, and that's always, I mean, the devil's in the details. And so that last mm -hmm. 10% is, is, um, is where all the time, a lot of the time is spent in that last 10%, getting it polished. And, that was, and back in those days, you didn't have uh, frequent patches like, like now. Um, so you had, to, you had to get it as really clean as possible. And then we're going back and forth with, we had a whole... Um, QA team, quality assurance. Um, and they were in, in the building as well. And so we worked closely with them and, uh, great people there as well. And, uh, yeah. And so it just took, took a lot of people to get it, the game clean and ready to ship. 
Now, in 1992, you worked on the Macintosh version of Castle Dr. Brain and the Amiga version of Leisure Suit Larry 5. Were you part of the development of the games for these platforms? I believe it was just the general programming that that uh, would work on all the platforms. And, and that was part of that that engineering group I was telling you about that that worked on the um, on the engine. Because I remember... I remember a couple of guys, I think Steve Collier and Chris Shankar, um, they were, they were working on specific platforms. Um, but, um, at our level, at the, at the game level, it was higher up. And, um, so we didn't have to deal with those specifics for the different, different hardware and different platforms. I, I had to learn that later in my, my Sony years. Um, but at the time it was just, it worked for everything. And so we moved to 1993, where you worked on Police Quest 4, open season. When you started working on the game, you mentioned that you were not a Police Quest fan. Um, did, you, did you like the game? Were you aware of, uh, of the controversy around the creation of this game? Um, yeah, at the time, I, I wasn't too worried about the con- controversy. I, I, uh, I just, yeah, I enjoyed it for what it was. And um, it was still an adventure game at heart and procedural police work. Um, and so, no, I just enjoyed it and did my best. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't have a problem with it at the time. Um, I just, <laughs> I wasn't, I mean, I was young and uh, I was doing my best to get the job done. And that same year, you also worked on Freddy Farkas, Frontier mm-hmm. Pharmacist. That was my first game as lead programmer. Um, for pretty Farkas. Um, and so that was exciting. I was a lead programmer and, and very unusual for that, those, those days. And still today is we had two female programmers on that, on that game. Um, I think we had about six programmers and that's also where I met Bill Shockley, who became a really good friend. Um, it was, a, um, just a funny, really funny guy. And used to hang out with him and, and another guy uh, that was a systems programmer that he ended up moving on. The other systems programmer ended up moving on to uh, what was, it was across the street. Um, I can't remember the, the online entity that Ken Williams branched off. I can't think what that's, what that was called. Um, working with AT&T, I believe. Um, anyways. Um, yeah. So to, that was one of the my guys I would hang out with um, back in those days. Um, but yeah, that's, so Bill Shockley was on that game and, um, and then also, yeah, and Josh Mandel was a lot, big part of that as well, along with Al. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, those were great times. And I remember specifically the, doing the bouncing ball with the, the ballad of Freddie Farkas. Um, and that was a challenge mm-hmm. to get that, on, get that on the beats. Um, but that was, that was fun. That was, uh, that was a challenge. And, and, and uh, we got it done. Yeah, I was about to mm-hmm. ask about that. How did you get that working? Get the MIDI to time perfectly with the lyrics and the ball itself? Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember the specifics. I think it had to do with, with the MIDI. MIDI. Um, I think the MIDI would give us, give us the beats. Um, and then we could program um, to that, that MIDI. There'd be an event, I believe, on, e- on each beat. And, uh, and we just had to do the, the ball um, arc in between. From beat to beat, I believe that's how how it worked. If I if I remember right, but yeah, it was always always something new and new challenges, and it was a lot of fun and, and a lot of puzzle solving. Just it was like it was like playing a game, it was making a game. Um, very similar. You had to figure out how to how to make things work and, and work the way that you want them to work. Now we move on to 1995, where you worked on Space Quest Six. The Spinal Frontier. Now, about a year ago, while translating the game to Hebrew for the Hebrew Adventure Project, uh, user Tzvika Z found a string that appears in one of the compost messages. He brought on users Kawa and Amar Moore, who helped him crack the case, and by doing that, they found an Easter egg that remained hidden for 27 years. Wow. Now, I don't know if you remember it, but what triggers this message is when you type the number 6832202. And after you enter this number, you get this message. It says, I dedicate this game. <laughs> I dedicate this game to my loving wife Michelle and our wonderful son Sean. I love them both very much. Love, Steve. 
wow, I didn't, I did not remember that, but now, now I, now I do. Um, yeah, that's really cool. That was to my. And so my people wife. looked up that particular number and found out that the phone number five five nine six eight three two two zero two belonged to one Stephen Conrad. Ah, okay. I, I don't even remember. So what that do you number. have to say for yourself? <laughs> well, I don't know. It's pretty uh, risky putting my phone number in a in a game. I guess it was, I guess it wasn't found until twenty seven years later, and and the number is long 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 gone. <laughs> Um, in my usage. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I guess it worked out. Okay. But yeah, that was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We had our, that's where I had my first son in 1994, uh, Sean, who's, who's gone on to great heights. He's currently a comedian in New York. Uh, I, he's 28 years old <laughs> and, uh, he's also, um, uh, he was, he's also a creative writer and he's, he's a script writer. Um, so, so yeah, that's my first son. And I, my second son hadn't been born yet until 1997 in, in Renton, when we lived in Renton, Washington. And he was born in, in Seattle. Um, but yeah, that, I, I was married. I got married in 1994 as well. In, uh, yeah, February 1994. And so you placed so, this Easter egg in the game without letting anyone know of its existence. <laughs> I, I don't know sure if that's, if that's true or not, um, but maybe so. But was just, back in the day, we did used to put um, Easter eggs in, in a lot of our games. And, and, and I was lead programmer on this, on Space Quest 6 also, which was a dream because, I, like I said, that was one of my favorite series from Sierra um, before I even went to college. Um, and it was a pleasure getting to know um, Scott Murphy and, and working with him um, at the time. But yeah, no, I had totally forgotten about that. And uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's really funny to see. Great to see. Unfortunately, Michelle and I are now divorced, um, but it was a good time, good time in our life. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I wouldn't have done it any differently. We had two great sons and we still get along um, to this day. And she still doesn't live too far from where I live. You should show her the Easter egg. Yeah, 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 I, I will. <laughs> Now, probably the most notorious bug of the entire Space Quest series is Error 47. When you try in Space Quest 6 to use the data card in the compost in sickbay, the game crashes and you get an output that says Error 47, not an object. <laughs> now, that error became quite notorious because a YouTuber called a Space Quest Historian, which you may know, um, has formed a band called Era 47 oh, wow. is named after this bug. So well so done this, on that. So, so this is a real, a real bug. It's not, it wasn't a, it wasn't an Easter egg. Yeah. It was actually a, a real bug. Sierra, Sierra online creative interpreter 47 error bug. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's very interesting. I didn't know, you know I, what I error know 47 any, is. No, I don't recall. Uh, my memory is not that good. Do, do we? Do you know? <laughs> the funny thing. The funny thing is the the the, you know, people talk about this error, but for me, the biggest bug for uh, from Sierra was a year before with King's Quest Seven, which you didn't work on. But for me, King's Quest Seven was was my introduction to beta testing because when I got uh, King's Quest 7 in Christmas of 1994, then I started playing the game and there was a chapter in the game in which you needed to give a, a nickel, a wood nickel to the shop owner in that chapter. Mm -hmm. And that particular uh, interaction didn't work in the original version of King's Quest 7. And so I played, the, I tried everything for months to see what will work and nothing worked. And so I called the hint line, which cost like, I don't know, a dollar a minute. And then I told them, what should I do with, uh, with the wooden nickel? And they tell me, give it to the shopkeeper. And I told them that it doesn't work. So they say, oh, it's a known bug. So we're going to send you a patch. We're going to send you a floppy disk with a patch to install in your computer. And so three weeks later, I got the patch <laughs> in the mail. So you mentioned the fact that uh, nowadays we have digital distribution and you can patch games easily. Even back then, 
Sierra didn't shy away from releasing patches on floppy disks. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess they had to wait till each person got got that bug and then send that person individual patches, which that's that's very interesting. But but good, yeah, it's good that they did it. And uh, I guess if if you didn't get that that far, or maybe you didn't get that far in the game, or maybe it only happened in certain sequences. I don't I don't know. But that's very interesting. So there were several releases. They released the initial version in Christmas 1994. And then after they found out about the bug, they started releasing the game with the floppy disk inside the big box. Mm -hmm. And then as a year later, they released the game with version 2.0, which fixed all okay. the bugs. Yeah, back in the day, that's, that's how the patch dis distribution had to be. Um, it was before the online patches. Um, that probably, probably online patches did happen. In my Sierra days, I, I don't remember for sure. It was probably very costly to release patches on floppy disks via mail. Right, right, right. But, but if, if the person can get through the game, then, then the, yeah, it had to be done, right? I mean. <laughs> now, in 1995, you also worked on Phantasmagoria. And... While I was looking at the SCI code, I noticed that it's very similar to Police Quest. Did uh, Police Quest Four? Did Police Quest Four lay the groundwork or or serve as the technical model for how Phantasmagoria would be developed without the full motion video scenes, which were added in Phantasmagoria and weren't present in Police Quest? But the SCI interactions and the SCI functionality. Um, I don't, I don't remember that specifically. Um, uh, to be honest with you, I, I just remember coming onto that game and, uh, um, like I said, uh, Chris Brayman was lead programmer. I think it was just the two of us, um, for a while at the beginning. Um, uh, but I, no, I don't remember, I don't remember the engine coming specifically from, um, did you say police quest four? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't recall because that because it was um, very similar. Even even Police Quest Four, um, unlike other graphic adventures by Sierra, Police Quest Four had the walk cycles and the the interactions between the characters were filmed, and then hmm. you converted these frames into the game. Okay, they were okay. real actors, so this was very similar to how Phantasmagoria worked. Uh, so you okay, said that yeah. there were two programmers at the, at the beginning of Fantasy. Yeah, Brand? at the very beginning, it was just Chris Brayman and myself. And and I remember our, one of our artists, Frank, Frankie, was was the stand-in um, for the for the lead female character, and she and we had her with the eight different directions uh, walking around the screen. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Fra Frankie, what? Well, I I don't remember her. She got, she married, uh, Richard Powell, um, back at, the, at that, at those years, <clears throat> I don't think they're still together, but, um, yeah, Frankie, Frankie Powell is how I remember. And she was a good friend at oh, least man. to hang out with them. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, when I looked at the resource files at Phantasmagoria, I noticed that there was a, someone that um, appeared in several walk cycles, and it wasn't Victoria Morsel, who was the lead uh, actress in the game. And I couldn't figure out who that woman was. <laughs> and, and so I asked everyone. I posted it on Sierra forums. And <laughs> even in my interview with Roberta Williams, I showed her the walk cycles and asked her, who, who's that person? <laughs> And she didn't know. Wow. Well, now you know. It, it was Frankie. And, and now you're just giving me the answer as the after, <laughs> as an afterthought. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. She, she, yeah. Her and um, her and uh, Richard threw great parties. I remember at the time at the Sierra Online um, at their mountain cabin. Um, yeah, I just had really fond memories of both of them. And uh, and 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 Frankie was one of the artists on on the on the game, and and she got chosen to be the early stand-in for the main character. So she was the standing one while, while you were do, doing technical tests for the, the game itself before 
anyone was cast or I, yeah, how early into production? I'm, I'm not sure when people were cast because I wasn't part of that, but I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it probably was before that. And it was just, it, it was, it, we were actually working on the game with, with the stand-in. Um, and we were actually programming the early, early basis of the game. Um, and until, in fact, I don't even know, I think I might have left before they switched um, to, to the actual actress. Um, because that's that's when I had the opportunity to, to move on to uh, Space Quest Six as lead programmer um, while I was working on Phantasmagoria. Um, and I believe Oliver Brelsford came on as lead programmer. If I, if I remember right, I'm not positive about that. But but uh, yeah, no, I don't. Well, I don't you think solve the 28 year old mystery. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm happy to do that. Yeah, because I remember that well. Because that was the beginning of. Um, beginning um, development of Phantasmagoria. I think that was before we had any of the video content. And so you didn't work on the functionality of adding uh, hotspots in actual FMV scenes? I don't recall. I don't recall doing that. Um, but it's not, not, in that, not in that game. Um, so I, I, I did, I do finally re remember doing uh, and I'm not sure if it was full motion video or not. I, I don't remember the details. Maybe it wasn't. But the the basement wolf scene with uh, and Gabriel Knight is it Gabriel Knight three? Um, and and no, Gabriel was, Knight two. You did the the wolf oh, scene. Oh, oh, that was two. Okay. Sins of the Father. Um, okay, yeah, the, yeah. The ending is the ending wolf, no, wolf yeah. chase. Oh, well, I did work on I did mm -hmm. work on Gabriel Knight two as well. But, but yeah, yeah, which so I can't that year, which in with. addition to Space Quest and Phantasmagoria, you worked on Gabriel Knight 2. And so okay. you worked on the end chase with the wolf when you go through the rooms and you need to lock the doors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a fun thing to do to try to make the, the pseudo AI work. So, um, so it was tricky to, to avoid them and, and, and do the right sequences and. Um, I just remember it fun to work on, and that was near the end of the end of the project. Now, so which game was that? Two or three? Gabriel Knight two. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, Gabriel Knight two. I, I get the two mixed up because I because I believe I well I also worked on three as well. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. okay, did. okay. I, so I, I guess it was two. I was getting the two and three mixed up because I believe it was two. I believe that that was the one where they were really desperate to get it out on time. And, and they're probably paying us under the table extra cash um, for, for overtime. Um, I, I remember our, our, our QA person, uh, Judy, I can't remember her last name, um, like really making out with the, with the extra cash. I, I, it, was, it was like, yeah, I don't know what it was, like 20 bucks a, an hour of overtime or something like that. <laughs> getting hundreds of dollars um, to get this game out the door and finished. And we were working hard on it. Um, I believe and Bill Shockley was also on that game. I don't remember who else as far as programmers. So you only worked on the wolf scene uh, in the end? Um, I don't, I don't recall exactly what I worked on. I feel like I worked on it more. No, I'm pretty sure I worked on a lot more of that game. Uh, that was just the part I remember. Um, that's where I, yeah, that's where I met Jane Jensen and, uh, Robert Holmes and, uh, yeah, great people. Um, and yeah, good, yeah, good times. Um, yeah, that was a fun game, fun game to work on both of those. So when was supposed to be the deadline for the release? Because that game was released in December of 1995, like four yeah, months a, after Phantasmagoria 1. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, it was Christmas release, um, which is like, it seems like most of our Sierra Online games were Christmas releases, if I remember right. Um, so yeah, they were, we were desperate to get, get, them, get out on time. And then the thing I remember about Phantasmagoria is it had the best royalties I had seen, because we had we got royalties at the time. There weren't a lot, but, but the Phantasma, even though I only worked on I don't know. I don't know how many months I worked on it, but like I worked on the beginning of it. I didn't finish it. Those royalties were really good, even for that partial work on Phantasmagoria. I remember that. Wait, you got royalties for the game? Yeah, based on sales. Um, uh, pro programmers, at least. <laughs> I assume the artists did too, and hopefully the musicians. The actors didn't. No. Yeah, I don't know. Um, 
I couldn't tell you. I just remember that, yeah, we did get, there were royalties at, at Sierra for programmers. Um, and Maybe that, they should have gone on strike back then as well. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, well, actors were new to us um, at Sierra in those early games. Yeah, that was a whole new ball game for, for Ken Williams and, and the company, I'm sure. And they're trying to figure out how to integrate um, actual actors into video games. Now, the year after, you worked on Leisure Suit Larry 7, Love for Sale, mm-hmm. which, in addition to having the SCI point-the-click functionality, you could also type commands, mm. like in the good old days. Okay. All right. That's what I'm probably remembering. Yeah, I, I had forgotten that. Um, and, and that was my first game in Bellevue, actually, after I moved up to Bellevue, Washington. Um, um, yeah, and I met a whole new group group of programmers up there. Um, I think Don, Don Munsell uh, was where I met Don Munsell on that, and his brother, brother Bob Munsell, um, I, who I believe was an artist, but Don was a programmer and uh, just a neat guy. Um, but but yeah, so that was my that was a whole new, another new environment in in Bellevue, Washington. Um, but yeah, it was by that time I knew Allo really well. And we, we, we'd go to his house. Um, we'd have some summer get-togethers there, if I remember right, and uh, in Issaquah, Washington. And, yeah, I was a great guy. Um, I remember him get, getting his, Lex, his Lexus on his 40th birthday. <laughs> it just came to me as we're talking. Um, and he was showing off his, his brand-new Lexus, which I think was a new type of um, – I don't know how long Lexus has been around. Toyota's um, um, high, high end, but he was really proud of that car. I remember him getting that on his 40th birthday. And uh, yeah, so those great times. Um, that was a blast working on Love for Sale. Um, I don't know if you had this on list. I actually got to play a little bit of trombone also um, in Love for Sale. I got to do the theme for uh, Peggy, the foul mouth deckhand, um, which was a sloppy um, mm-hmm. like sa- sailor song on, on trombone. Um, and that was fun to record. Um, and also that's where I remember meeting some of the musicians, Ben Hogue and David Henry um, were the musicians on that game, I believe. And I just saw Ben Hogue for the first time in like 25 years in New York City when I was there visiting my son um, just back in May. Got to, to hang out with Ben Hogue. And uh, who all, he, he's a big, starting to learn how to program actually and, and do some programming even though he's been I mean, he's a lifelong mus- musician and composer. And he worked on those really uh, music uh, for, for in Bellevue for Sierra Games. But yeah, that was, that was a blast. So you, were, yeah. you were credited on trombone. You were credited on trombone in addition to uh, lead programming. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, I'm uh, sensing a pattern here. It seems like, like they only hired jazz musicians at Sierra. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, it didn't hurt to, <laughs> to be, jazz, especially if you want to work with Al Lowe, because he was a he was a jazz musician and 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 he grew up playing music and loved hanging out with musicians and telling stories and um, yeah, it, it could be it, it sure didn't hurt to be a jazz musician. In fact, I, now that you you mentioned the jazz, I remember. Um, Al Lowe went to the, uh, I believe it's called the Mad Hatter studio in LA. Um, I think it was in LA. Uh, it was Chick Corea's um, studio to re- record, I believe, the opening music for, for Love for Sale um, and do it with a, a jazz, um, uh, I believe it was sax and in, 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 uh, in a rhythm section, bass, piano, and drums. Um, and he was, he was really proud to be able to do that in the Mad Hatter Chikoria recording studio. And so L- Love for Sale also included the CyberSniff 2000. Remember that? <laughs> I, I do. It was a, it was a card, card that came, came with the game, the Scratch and Sniff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. I didn't recall it. It was, it was cyber, cyber, sniff, <laughs> cyber Sniff, but that's, that's, that was funny. Everything was always funny in an Allo game. And I remember, I do remember that it had one rude, rude smell in there, at least one rude smell, um, now that you mention it, but I had forgotten about it. Yeah. But that, yeah, that was ahead of our time. We were, 
that was, I guess that was 3D. <laughs> um, I don't know if a game would be considered two, 3D. So, so I don't know if it was a fourth d- dimension or not, but <laughs> we might have we might have joked about it at the time. I don't remember exactly. Uh, so, at that point, you already worked on you were lead programmer on Space Quest Six and lead programmer on Leisure Suit Larry, which were both favorites of yours. Before oh, your well, Sierra days. Before before that, my first one was uh, Freddie Farkas Frontier Pharmacist. That was my first as lead programmer. That's yeah. Yeah, but I'm mentioning I'm mentioning these two because you mentioned them as favorites of yours before oh, yeah. your Sierra days. So how is it to be part of the the each one of these series, given that you worked on them as a lead programmer and as a previous and present fan? Yeah, I was li- living the dream. <laughs> I, got, I got to work with my my heroes and uh, and uh, and see all the behind the scenes and and be a part of it. After reading about it, I used I remember reading the Sierra Online magazine back in the day, reading about the two guys from Andromeda and about Al Lowe and all the and Roberta Williams and all the behind the scenes. And so now I was a part of it, and and it was great. Um, and Josh Mandel was another great personality and really funny guy that I got to know and uh, work with. And I, I still still use his uh, <laughs> fork fork in the eye trick to this day, which in, involved a, a creamer packet and a fork. <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? <laughs> sure. Um, basically, you would you would palm the, the creamer. Um, in your hand and, and hold it up to your eye and, and, and with a fork and then the white liquid would, would pour from your, your eye socket looking as if you had punctured, <laughs> punctured your eye. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's the high level. <laughs> but that was, I, was, I remember being, there was a, a, I can't remember the name of the place. It was a, oh, it was the Sierra Grill. We would hang out with, and I remember that's where I learned the uh, coffee creamer um, fork in the eye trick from Josh Mandel. Well, I hate to be a party pooper, but you could actually puncture your eyeball doing that. <laughs> well, it was very, yeah, no, of course. It, it was very, um, you had to learn to go ex- not too far, right? I and mean, you had to go the right distance. Um, and of course, yeah, no, it, you had to work on it over time to, to perfect it. And yeah, it, it could go very wrong if, uh, not done right. Yeah. Just don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> now, the, the projects, two of the projects you worked on um, after Leisure Suit Larry Love for Sale were Leisure Suit Larry's Casino and King's Quest Mask of Eternity. Yeah. Now, Leisure Suit Larry's Casino. Uh, is somewhat of an odd project, as it seems that it wasn't supposed to be a Leisure Suit Larry game at all, and was just reskinned as such uh, later in production. Is that correct? Um, I don't know if I know that detail, but I mean that sounds very possible. Um, in fact, no, I, I think yeah, not, I think about it. I think you might be right, and they yeah they wanted to put a brand on it and and made it a, a Larry game. But the, the other thing I, I remember specifically about that game, yeah, there you go. I have a copy as well. Um, is uh, that that was written in a different language. That was not in SCI. Um, we were using uh, C++, which mm-hmm. was went on to be what I would program in for the rest of my career. Um, and so that was, that was the first time I, I really learned C++, and that was a daunting task for me because um, C was – a very technical language and you could easily make mistakes. Um, and there was a bunch of po- pointer um, math that you had to do in C and C and C plus plus. And, but that was, that was where I, I started first started getting my C plus plus chops together. And uh, so that, that was, that was good for me. That was, and by the end of it, um, I, I was programming pretty well in C plus plus. Oh, and it was also my first time working with uh, online programming and making things work mm-hmm. over a network, over a network. And so that was all new for me as, as well. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of new things working on, on that technology in that game um, to get that done. 
And, uh, yeah, I grew a lot as a programmer. Um, on that the game, game itself had also a single player mode, which was called practice mode, if I remember correctly. And the online elements were when you played against other people. How did you, how did you go about this task? How did you tackle it, given that it was a first for you and probably it was a new thing at Sierra in general? Yeah, just just had to learn. Um, there, I guess I'm sure there are people that knew more about online programming than I did, um, but uh, who I learned from and I learned about this whole concept of packets where you send a, a pack, a small packets um, across, across the network. Um, it had to be small enough and fast enough um, so the game wouldn't slow down. Um, so I was just learning a lot of these, a lot of these things that were foreign to me at the time. And, uh, and a lot of trial and error. And, uh, I'm sure we had a, in, uh, we were able to, to, uh, have an in network, um, for testing purposes where we could play against each other in the office. Um, so yeah, I don't remember all the details, but I remember it was all, all new for me anyways. And, uh, but from, if I remember, I pulled it off. But but you also reminded me because of the games. Um, one of my proud accomplishments back it was back on Lazy Suit Larry Seven was the Liars Dice game, um, which I, I programmed, which which used a lot of AI to because there was bluffing involved and um, mm-hmm. and I was pretty proud of the at the time. I haven't played it since then, but I was pretty proud of what I had accomplished um, with the AI, with the AI component of Liars Dice at the time with the with the AI bluffing and and trying to catch your bluffs and all that kind of, uh, that kind of programming stuff. That was, that was a challenge at the time. Do you remember the exact functionality you implemented in the game for this AI? I just, I just remember, no, I don't. I remember, I remember trying to mapping it out, mapping it out at the time, um, how it might work. And then and just lots of iterations from there. And, and I saved the code. I still have the code. Um, on probably on probably on this laptop, but because uh, I was really proud, I was so proud of it. But I, I don't know if I've ever gone back to it to look at it since then. Um, so I don't remember many of the details, but um, but I just remember I was really proud of it and, and the way it played. And and, uh, and I think I think it was a standalone demo as well, if I remember right, um, for the game. Um, but yeah. Oh, and and then yeah. that, that that just jogged another memory. Of, and I believe that was while I was still at um, in Oakhurst, was I worked on a not like a productivity software for Sierra Online, for the Palm Pilot. The Palm Pilot was a big deal at the time, and we we made a we made an app for the for the Palm Pilot. Um, I can't even remember what, what it did, but um, but that was a whole new learning experience too in making a yeah a PC companion app for the that worked with that hardware. Anyways, I'm sorry, that's just flashback um, while we're talking about yeah. te- technical challenges. These flashbacks are great. <laughs> now, do you remember that uh, you took this photograph in Leisure Suit Larry's Casino? You're over here. Let me see. Uh, You're this trying to see, I, I'm trying to see what the background is. because Oh, so oh, yeah, Leisure Suit Larry's Casino, right. Yeah, no, I, I do remember taking lots of photos. I, I don't know if I remember taking that specific photo, but but yeah. But yeah, it was a good time. But I do, I do remember when we were working on Freddie Parker's bunch of pharmacists, we all went out to like an old West um, place in California where we did lots of photography and, and we were hung out for the day and uh, had good times with all my teammates. Um, and we took lots of pictures then. I, I just remembered Allo had like a Mickey Mouse glove on <laughs> at one point. I don't know why, but uh, it just flashed in my, my memory. But uh, These yeah, were pro- we, promotional uh, photographs, or I, I believe we used them for promotional material um, as well as just our own. I remember we had, all had Western shirts on, and um, and it was just the whole Western thing. But that was back for the Frontier Pharmacist, uh, and that was just some fun times. Now back to 1998, as I said, you worked on King's Quest: Mask of Eternity, where you are credited for Undetermined. <laughs> really what I know undetermined that. work did you perform on king's quest 8 <laughs> well undetermined so that means 
whoever wrote that didn't know what I worked on. Apparently, um, maybe you do. I'll, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to remember. I, I remember that was it was my first three D game. That was actual actual three D um, programming. Um, and yeah, I just, I just had a flashback for something like some kind of interface. I can't remember what it was um, that I might have done in that game. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was, I guess I was a utility programmer on that game because that was, I was after the Zuzu Larry seven or maybe after casino. Um, I guess casino was after seven. Um, mm-hmm. and then, yeah, I was, I was a utility programmer and I had worked with some new programmers I hadn't worked with before on that game. Um, all good guys. And, uh, yeah, um, I don't, I don't remember very many specifics, but I, I remember it was the first 3D game I had ever worked on. It was a 3D system, and that was another learning experience. Now, on February 22nd, 1999, Sierra closed down its Oakhurst facility, firing two-thirds mm-hmm. of the employees there. Scott Murphy called this day Chainsaw Monday. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you remember about that day? Well, I wasn't, I wasn't there anymore at the time. Um, so I, I really don't, don't recall much about it. Um, I don't even, I don't even know if I knew about it at the time, to be honest with you. I should have, cause I mean, I'm sure some of my good friends were still there. I mean, I, I must've known, but so that was actual, you say, you say the whole studio closed down that day or. No, or two, thirds, two, two thirds. thirds. Oh yeah. You know what? I, I, okay. I, I think I do remember. Cause I think I, I remember a few people end up coming up to Bellevue if I remember right. Um, I'm not positive about that, but, but yeah, it was always a dark day. I mean, it, it, remind, it reminds me of earlier days in, uh, Sierra where, where they put us all in, uh, in the, in the local movie theater in Oakhurst and, and, and we all got envelopes and, and, it, and like half the people got laid off. I don't remember that. That was, that was the, I remember. And that was really sad. That was, that was earlier. I don't know what year that was, but that was obviously before I left in 96. Um, but yeah, we, we, I think, I think we had an Easter thing maybe the next year and we all joked that we were all going to get Easter eggs <laughs> that were half of us would get laid off <laughs> inside the Easter egg. Um, but, but yeah, that was a sad day and people were out in the parking lot crying and um, it was really, that was really, it was really tough. Wait, um, so they put you all in a movie theater and they gave all of you envelopes, not just the ones who got fired. All of you got envelopes and some of the envelopes had um, letters telling them that they're fired and the others <laughs> were what? Empty letters? I, I, letters I don't telling remember, you, great job. I don't remember. I don't remember the details. Well, I'm pretty sure everybody got, got one so that you, would, <laughs> you wouldn't know um, who was who at the time. Until you walk out in the parking lot and they're crying, um, but yeah, it was just a sad day. And uh, and I, if I remember right, it was like half the people. It was like a half and half type thing. Um, I don't remember what year. And I remember stories before that were telling tell about uh, having a, having a, getting have a company meeting, and and whoever didn't make it in time, those people were laid off. I don't know if that's true or not. I think that was before my time. Uh, um, <laughs> but that's fun. Um, but oh yeah, oh yeah, good times. Um, but yeah, so that that's what I remember. I don't remember all the details about '98, um, but I do remember a few years later when it was totally shut down. And then the same, I went through the same process at at Bellevue, and we were having layoffs like every six months, if I remember right. Because I remember I went in, I, I I don't know if it was like it had to be like 19 beginning of 1999. Um, I was ready to move on at that, at that point. I wanted to try something. I wanted to move on to video games from, from computer games. Um, and I went into Mark Hood's office. He was in charge of programmers. And I told him, Hey, hey Mark, I wouldn't mind being laid off in the next layoffs. Cause, because the, you, it's pretty good. You got, you got a layoff package. Um, and that would last, give you salaries for so many months. Maybe, maybe based on how long you were there. And so I actually asked to be laid off. And, and I said, I wouldn't mind, mind being, cause I wanted, I mean, if somebody else didn't, didn't want to be laid off and sure, I'll, I'll, I was ready to move on. And he just kind of laughed at me at the time and said, yeah, wouldn't it, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> That's what he said to me. 
<laughs> so anyways, I kept working, but eventually I did get laid off in, in, in 99, end of 99, I believe. They maybe this two layoffs after that. After, because like I said, it was every, every six months for the last two years, I believe. And then, and eventually Bellevue did get, go away. Um, and then, and yeah, and then I applied for, I had a couple of job offers, um, video game companies and, and went to one. Layoffs every six months sounds like company policy. Well, it was just, it was, it was, um, coming to an end. Um, and which it did. Um, not too long after that. I don't know when the official... Now, speaking of company policies, um, I heard that Ken Williams told the employees at Sierra not to play any of the competitors' games because they wanted the Sierra to be leaders and not followers. So they didn't allow you to play any of the competitors' games. Is that true? Not to my knowledge. I had never heard that before. We, I used to play... A lot of the competitors games I remember playing Tex Murphy in the office uh, I remember playing um, playing the, the uh, Monkey Island games which I enjoyed thoroughly um, I, I have never heard that before and I played all the games and, and to me that's how that's how you you get better as you play the competition and you take the best of everything um, so no I never heard that and I didn't didn't follow those rules if they were rules it's first I've heard of it Now, you mentioned that you were uh, laid off at the end of 1999, but in the 1999 holiday season, Gabriel Knight 3 was released, and you worked mm. on that project. What that can you tell us about that, given that it was your second 3D game? Okay. Yeah, that's why I was getting it mixed up. So I guess, yeah. So, so Gabriel Knight 2 was my last game in, in, um, in Oakhurst. And I had forgotten that this game... Was programmed in Bellevue um, okay you know what I, I kind of mix that game and and uh, King's Quest together in my mind but but now that now that you talk about it now I do have memories of programming specifically on Gabriel Knight uh, <laughs> um, in Bellevue but um, what, what what am I listed am I undetermined on that game as well or, or <laughs> what, what's no my you're goal? listed on the programmers okay okay yeah no that yeah you're right um yeah i did i remember it pretty well yeah that was that was a fun game um i said my, my memory jogged um yeah that was cool and that's so that was also a full motion video and and 3d or is it just 3d no it was just 3d oh, okay okay all right yeah no i remember i remember i remember 3d characters yeah in actual 3d And uh, yeah, it's been cool technology and and I, and, and I guess Jane, Jane Jensen must have been up in Bellevue at the time. I, I take it. <laughs> I don't remember specifically. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and, and I believe she, she married Robert Holmes, who did the music for Gibro Knight. Um, but I, yeah, I don't yeah. So anyways, they were, yeah, they're really nice people, and uh, we're, we're going to work with them. working well with them and uh yeah it's just been a fun experience and a challenging experience and i mean now that i think about it, there it might have been that game where i worked on an interface um screen which i can't recall what it was maybe maybe you could jog my memory if there were any kind of uh um screens to, to well, like it is the computer there were interfaces in the computer compu- you could computer check yeah things. That was it. I worked on that computer. I don't remember specifically what I did on that, but I, I do remember working on that computer screen. So given that um, Sierra shifted to 3D around 98 uh, with their adventure games at the time, and LucasArts did the same with Green Fandango and later on with Escape from Macallan, were there any talks behind the scenes about the fact that whether or not 3D is a viable technology For adventure games that were mainly 2d and graphic in nature yeah well at the time yeah that was a big talk and uh, and but but I think if I remember right it was just that was that was the way forward um, and that's we I think we thought that we we have to do this um, we're not 
I'm not going to be making 2D games anymore. Uh, that was my, that's my feeling and my understanding at the time. Um, that, that this is the future and we got to figure out how to make adventure games in 3D space. And that was a challenge. I remember that was a challenge. Um, and that was a big part of what we had to try to figure out how to make those games work in 3D. And did you have any technical difficulties given the fact that you used 3D acceleration hardware for the game? I don't, I don't remember that specifically, but I, I remember PC games in general were very hard to work on because of all the different configurations. Yeah, some people could have accelerators and some not. And we had to make it work on, on every configuration. And that was, part, that was a huge part of the QA was them having all these, all these kinds of different configurations and, and have this trouble, troubleshoot um, different configurations and, and how to make it work on that. And then once it got out in the wild, people, of course, had even new, newer configurations that we might have to patch. And then that's and then, and then that was a big breath of fresh air when I went to console programming, um, because now now it's just one piece of hardware, and everybody has that hardware, and and there's no differences, and that was a, that was a big difference. So when did you move to console programming, exactly? Well, when when I left Sierra Online at the end of '99, I I had two I had two job offers, um, one at um, a company in Texas, I, I don't recall the name, but they were working on a racing game. And then the other one was at a claim in Utah um, on NBA Jam. And uh, I remember at the time to, trying to figure out what, where, where, where do we want to move? Do we want to move to Texas or do we want to move to Utah? And my, my kids were really young at the time. And, and I think it was mostly a joke, but I said, I don't want my kids to, to grow up with a drawl. So, so, so we'll take the Utah job so they don't have, all have a drawl, like talk, talk like a Texan. <laughs> so, so we took, I took the Utah job <laughs> and, uh, and unfortunately that was short, short lived, but it gave me a lot of, oh, cause I, I did apply at Sony at the same, at the time I applied for those jobs and I didn't get, the, didn't get the Sony job, but I remember flying down to San Diego and talking to um, some people. And, uh, and I kind of want, I wanted that Sony job, but I didn't get it at the time. Um, but I got the acclaimed job and I was working on NBA jam. I was working with a lead programmer, Larry Hutchinson, 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 one of the two. Um, and he was a great guy and learned a lot from him and learned about, um, collision detection, um, the basketball on the rim. Mm -hmm. I remember doing a lot with that. And that was all brand, brand new for me as, as well as console programming was a whole, whole new ball game, a whole different, there's a whole different programming loop going on um, where everything's animating and everything's going through this loop. And, uh, but, but that I bought it, we bought a house there and my kids were in school and that job only lasted seven, seven months. Um, Cause they, they started having layoffs. Um, and then, and they laid off me as well as, and my, that whole game was canceled. And a third of the company got laid off seven months later after I bought a house and everything. Um, but that experience got, then I applied for Sony again, and that's where I got my Sony job and all that experience all, um, helped me get that job because now I knew how to, to program console video games. And, uh, then I got, I got the Sony job, which was my last company that I worked there for 23 years from 2000 until I just retired in April of 2023. Um, and that was a, just a great, great company with great people. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just very, very stable and we're really able to grow. And, uh, first game on there was a uh, action adventure beat em up. Um, speaking of 3d, um, called the Mark of Cree. And, uh, that was a lot of fun. I did enemy, enemy AI on that game. Um, and it was very unusual too, because, um, you, the whole, all enemy would surround the barbarian hero character from all angles. And, and there were all these different fighting techniques where they would come in uh, certain groups from the front or from the back or from all angles. And the cool thing about that game is you, you would rotate the, uh, the controller around and then he could, he could target the different enemies all, all around him in front, back, back diagonal. And that was the, that was the new thing that that game, that game did. And, and it had a stealth element where you could go, you could be totally stealthy. 
or you could be totally action, just go bursting in and, and fighting everybody or, or a combination. And it was pretty cool um, that you could have all these different elements. Um, and yeah, so it was kind of like a, it was like action adventure um, game. And, and that's where I did enemy AI, AI, AI programming. Oh, and I should mention, so through my Sierra online days, I did audio programming as well as game, game programming was what my main thing was. Um, but then, so after, after Mark of Cree, I ended up working on a baseball game for the rest of my career at, at Sony. Um, and that was as an audio programmer, uh, as just audio programmer. And, and I, and Chris Brayman had, had come up, had preceded me to Sony and he was working on the baseball game and he recruited me um, um, to work on baseball as an audio programmer. And that turned out to be a, the great thing for the rest of my career. Um, worked with great people and um, is a great team and a great environment. And um, I learned a lot and learned a lot about audio programming specifically and got to play a little bit of trombone on that too. And uh, for the PA cheers and jeers in the, in the stadium, especially the, especially the trombone wah wah, uh, if, you, if, or if there's an error in the baseball game, the wah 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 wah. Uh, so that was fun. But anyways, um, yeah, that, that was you. That was me, <laughs> as well as the yeah the 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 foul mouth that can Peggy um, theme song, <laughs> which hilarious that, which was my other claim to fame on trombone in gaming. <laughs> and so what does uh, an audio programmer do well you do all everything audio um well, one of the big things uh, for me was um on the baseball game was the the play-by-play -play and color commentary um so we got we have real life um announcers commentary and uh it was all a bunch of different little parts originally the we did it different ways throughout my career. At first, it was all written out, and the and the talent um, who was at, our first talent was the legendary Vin Scully, who, who did Dodger games forever, and was one of the longest um, radio and television broadcasters of all time. Um, he was he was doing the game when I first came on, and then um, and the different color commentary. Dave Campbell was on there. And then we we end up switching to a local um, San Diego Padres announcer, but Matt Baskersian at the time, um, and he we had him for like about fifteen years until we switched to uh, a new set of um, programmers, um, Boog Shiambi and uh, Chris Singleton, in the last three or four years for for a big overhaul and big change. But so so that was just a small part of it. There's a huge database of things. As announcers could say, and then the programmers, we had to feed in uh, thousands of parameters based on every situation. Um, and there was an engine that Chris Brayman wrote called SCAT that would take all this data and uh, and all these parameters you pass in and figure out the best thing to say at that at each moment in the game. Um, and that was actually a, a, an engine that he wrote for a wrestling game when he he was at Sculpture Software, which became a claim back in Utah. Um, and that, and but see, Sony bought that engine from Chris and, and we still use it to this day. Um, but so commentary, that was a huge part of it. And, and the AI to make that all sound natural and to say the right things and, and not make it sound like, make it, make it sound like they're actually watching the same game that you're playing. You know, and it's all interactive, so you don't know what's what's going to happen. Especially the user, user could do anything. The, the AI would do. We would know what the AI would do, but the user could do anything. But that was just a small part of it. And then the crowd. We had the crowd. There's a background crowd, and there's uh, people yelling in the crowd. There's uh, chants. We we're doing chants, and and we got to be a part of all these recordings as well. There would be yell recordings where people are yelling individual yells, and there. Were, there would be a big group of people doing chants. Um, and those had to all be integrated in the game. And, uh, and then, yeah, so the base crowd and the crowd yells on top of that. And they had chants. You have know, the umpires. The umpires were doing their thing. You have, uh, well, some music. Music was a huge part of it. 
Um, so you'd have broadcast music during the game, and we'd also have licensed tracks at the beginning of the game. And everything had to flow smoothly from, from the front end into the game and back again. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot to audio programming. And and uh, just getting the balance. And did you handle right. any of the surround sound aspects? Yeah, yeah. Um, though the yeah the engine would handle the surround sound, but we had to make sure we use that engine correctly. Um, definitely, yeah, and definitely, there's a lot of work on the umpires would come from behind you um, because they were behind you in, in the game, and then the the crowd based on where you were looking, the, the sounds had to come from the right direction. And then with headphones, it became really critical to have it sound like it's coming from all around you. So surround, surround sound is a big part of it. And we're, we're pretty proud of um, what we're able to accomplish um, in the surround sound space in the baseball game um, through the years. And which parameters did you use for the commentary? You'd use the player name, probably. Oh, uh, yeah. The it, player I mean, you're currently controlling. And... There's literally thousands. I mean, and every 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 moments an event so let's say so you're at bat that's a big event right so there's um so every time you, t- you take a pitch you gotta there's the trajectory of the pitch the speed of the pitch the velocity the spin on the pitch um, um and then the bat swing how fast the bat is swung uh, what part of the bat the ball hits um there's gonna be a different sound if it's, if it's at the base of the bat if it's a sweet spot the bat if it's at the end of the bat Oh, and also the audio controlled the vibration, controller vibration. So, um, so actually, speaking of the bat hits, the that solid that solid wood sound when you hit right in the sweet spot would be the least vibration on the bat because that's where you hit it smoothly. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry again. Sorry, all of a sudden my Siri just popped up here. <laughs> Start talking to me. Sorry, um, it's not the voices in my head. She, I, I she can join the conversation if she wants. <laughs> she's not. She's not too smart. I'd rather not. Um, so anyway, anyways, um, yeah. So that's that's one example. Then yeah, the swing of the bat. Um, if the bat was a ball or a ball or a strike, um, what part of the there was all the the location of the pitch was broken down into maybe 16, 18, 20 different locations. Um, so those were all parameters of, of where the ball landed that, that just, and then we're just talking about a bat, uh, at bat. And then like every time you hit, you got the stepped on the first base, there'd be a bunch of parameters. How fast was the runner running? Um, how fast, who, who was throwing the ball? Where's the ball coming from? Uh, which fielder, um, is there a cutoff man? Um, just, just, it was a lot, lot more than you'd ever imagine. Um, these parameters, it was, it was a lot. And so all this tons of data would come in to figure out the perfect thing to say at each moment. And so it was a pretty, pretty impressive engine that, that Chris wrote. And like I said, and we're still using it 20, 20 something years later. So that shows you the longev- longevity of the technology. Now, as you mentioned, you recently retired. Uh, how has retirement been treating you so far? It's, it's fantastic. Um, um, I, I retired on the early side. I just turned six, 60 in January. Um, and one of those reasons for that is because, unfortunately, I had a heart attack in 2021, um, which was a huge wake-up call for, for myself. And, uh, and I've lost, I lost like 50 pounds from my, from my highest weight. And so I've, I've, I made a point to, to stay in shape and, and work out with weights and, and lose weight. And I'm still working on the, the, the very end of it now, the last – <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get an, ult, an, an ultimate shape, my ultimate shape. And I'm pretty close, but anyways, that's, that was a huge priority was to be in shape and to want to live all these years. Um, be able to see my sons and their progress. And I want to see where technology goes, uh, virtual reality and alternate reality. Um, anyway, so that, that, if that hadn't happened, I'd probably still be working today. Um, cause like I said, I had, a, I was on a great team and <laughs> making really good money. Um, but my priorities shifted, um, when that happened and, uh, but yeah, no, I'm loving life. I'm able to start practice my trombone again. Um, I have, I have dreams of making a trombone album with the, with the best players in the world, um, which I'm, I'm working on and getting the best arrangers. And, uh, so that's, that's a project and, and, and I'm just trying to work on myself as an improviser. 
yeah, as an improviser and improve my skills um, on the trombone because I didn't have time to, I, I, I continue to play throughout my whole career, but just not enough hours in the day to spend much time with it. And now I'm able to, to get back into my, my playing and maybe join a band. And um, if it's fun, I'm only going to do things that are, that are fun. But uh, yeah, I love it. I love I love retirement and do be able to do what I want to do when when and I'm doing lots and of relaxing, tra- lots of traveling. Yeah, very relaxing. I'm doing lots of traveling. I've already had like three three trips. I went to New York. Um, you know, went to Las Vegas for the. I played poker. I played in the World Series of Poker. Um, that was fun. I actually placed in the senior seniors event. Um. um and uh, and then went to on a family little family vacation. Just got back from Boise, Idaho. We just picked a random spot and all hung out together in a really cool house. Did some activities, and um, my boys are on separate coasts. One's in Santa Cruz, one's in New York, and so they they were there. My mom and her significant other were there. My brother and his wife from um, Oregon. We all converged and had a great great time. And then my son's going to be performing at the Edinburgh. Um, Fringe Festival in August in uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland, and so I'll I'll be traveling to Edinburgh, and I'm going to s- see his performance out there. Um, I'm going to go towards the end. He's doing the whole month of August. I'm going to go to the end of August, and then we're going to go together to France. We're going to start in the south of France in Monaco, and work our way up to Paris um, by train and different activities along the way, and then I'm going to. Um, I'm going to go to fly off on my own to uh, Italy, um, which I've never been. And it's always been like a dream spot for me to see just the beginning of modern civilization. And uh, it's always been a dream of mine. And so I'll be doing that um, here in August and September. So excited about that. But I can't continue to spend money like this all the whole time. Cause it's going to run out. So, but I'm, I'm enjoying this first part and then I'll, I'm sure I'll settle down at some point. Sounds like you got the next couple of months planned out perfectly. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's exciting. And, and I, I, I get to play my trombone a little bit every day. I already, already warmed up this morning. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Um, and, and just, and, and I mean, you definitely have to have a perspective of what, what you want to do when you retire. Like I've been thinking about it for a long time now, since, since I retired, since that heart attack two years ago. Um, and so so yeah, I mean, I mean, I have friends that haven't thought about it, and they're going to continue to work. But, but you need to know what you're going to do. It, just any advice, anybody that wants to, that's going to retire, you got to know what you're going to do with your hours. And I and I, I was basically trying to live those um, for my last year of of employment as well. Start practicing um, what that might be like. And I was lucky enough to to work out of my my house um, the last seven or eight months. Um, of course, we all we all learned how to work during the pandemic um, from our homes, um, which we didn't know we could do. Um, we had to figure out with development kits, and uh, and and our baseball. And I, even though I work for Sony, we we were always on the PlayStation platform. And but but the Major League Baseball they wanted to be on all the platforms. So so we learned how to be on all the platforms. Um, we're now we're on the Nintendo Switch, and uh, we're on the on both Xboxes and both uh, version, we have PS4, PS5. So, so we lear- learned how to how to be multi-platform um, for the baseball game. Um, but, but, anyways, I don't know how I got up on that, but, um, but yeah, you, you need to know what you're going to do with your time. But I'm enjoying it immensely. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. Um... Retirement sounds like fun, apart from the heart attack that uh, initiated this whole process. But, but I'm glad to hear that you're doing better now. And, and so what are your plans after you're back from all of the trips? Do you have any <laughs> pet projects you want to work on or any future plans that you want to work on that, um, after you're back from your vacations? Yeah, well, that 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 jazz album is a big one, and it's going to take lots of. I'm going to have to learn a lot of um, things about how to put that together, especially with trombone players from all over the world. Um, it's basically going to be eight eight trombones and rhythm section, 
Um, when, when I was a kid, my dad had a, an, an album. He was a French horn player, but he had a trombone album. And for whatever reason, trombone, well, trombone is closest to the human voice as far as instruments. Um, and so there's a lot of trombone specific albums with, with like eight trombones or four trombones and rhythm section because they blend really well. Um, and have a great have a great sound together and play some great harmonies um, together, kind of like the singing. Like for the four freshmen or the high lows is the singing singing groups. More modern groups would be uh, uh, shoot uh, take five or take six. Take six, <laughs> take five is a Dave Brubeck album. Um, but uh, so that's that's gonna be a big project um, and lots to figure out and lots to learn, and it's gonna be a fair amount of expense as well as well. Um, I've already reached out to some arrangers and, and I'm hoping, hoping Chris Brayman will be involved with that. I've already started bugging him about it. <laughs> um, but that's, that'll be a big project. To take what up about the LO? LO? Well, he's not a trombone player, so, so, so he's out. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, seriously, it is, it is, it is trombone, trombones in, in the rhythm section. So. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how he would be involved, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I, I need to re- reach out to Al because it's been too long since I've, I've talked to him. Although I'm still a s- subscriber to his Cyber, Cyber Joke 3000 for many years, <laughs> which is the daily jokes that he would send out. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for taking the time to join me in this conversation today. It's been great chatting with you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. It's been, uh, you jogged my memory on many things. And, and that was a nice, um, it was nice to relive that Easter egg that I I totally forgotten about in, in Space Quest. And I will share that with Michelle and my son. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for solving the 28 year old mystery of <laughs> who's the stand in in Phantasmagoria 1. I'm glad I could help. I, I wish I knew her, her, her unmarried name, but. I, I don't, but it was Frank Frankie, F-R-A-N-K-I-E, was our, was our stand-in. We'll try to find her. Okay, and she is an artist. I'm sure she's listed as an artist on Phantasmagoria. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> no problem. <laughs>